te kore, ki te po, ki te aumarama. From the void into the night and into the world of light. The journey from te kore, the beginning of time, through te po, darkness, and into te aumarama, the world of light, is at the heart of great leadership. And our task as leaders is to reach into te kore and release that potential into the world and create more light. And we are standing at a new threshold, a 21st century version of te kore, which is an opportunity to help navigate from darkness to light where people are crying out for effective solutions. And the great leaders of the ancient cultures of Māori and Polynesia were wayfinders who went beyond the known and on journeys of discovery to new horizons. And they navigated from a different worldview. And their experiences have valuable insights for us as we navigate an increasingly complex and changing world. And today's wayfinders are the living face of a philosophy of being that has been transmitted from one generation to the next through millennia. Without magnetic compasses, sextants or maps, these intrepid explorers traverse something like 25 million square kilometres of ocean, settling different islands and island chains. And their double-hulled sailing walker, those tough, sturdy vessels built to survive ocean-going expeditions were the inspiration for the America's Cup racing catamarans. And today's modern GPS systems echo the methods used by wayfinders to judge position in relation to place markers. And their incredible feats have been likened as akin to going to the moon because they were journeying at a time when most of Europe thought that the world was flat and that if you just traveled to the edge of the world, you would drop off into space or you would flip upside down and enter the Antipodes. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, John Panaho and Hoturoa Barclay Kerr. Together, we formed the Wayfinding Leadership Collaboration. Our journey started when I was at Harvard University and invited to write a book on Māori leadership. And that path took me to Hotūroa, thanks to John. Hotūroa infused this work with the real experiences of the wayfinders. He breathed life into it. And he is the direct descendant of Hotūroa the great high priest who navigated the Tai Nui Waka to Aotearoa. And I'd also like to acknowledge the thousands of people who've attended our workshops or listened to our talks because you have really helped this work come into being in a powerful way. The first step of wayfinding leadership is what Hotu describes as stepping into your rangatira space. Rangatira is a word that is synonymous with chiefliness, with leaderliness. And when we look at that word, we see it comprises two parts. Ranga, or raranga, which means to weave, and tira, group. So a leadership, our task is to weave a group together. Now this isn't like some kind of master puppeteer who's holding all the strings and manipulating people. This is the act of weaving, where every person is a thread in the community. Each person expressing leadership at different times, lending their own specialness, expertise and effort as we weave as a movement through time as part of something bigger than us. It also involves working with tension and finding balance. So we're going to have a, a video clip now where Hutu is going to describe the experience of a young navigator who stepped into his rangatira space.
So our trainee navigator on Henry was Waddy, and this was to be his big test. Uh, it was really cloudy, 100% cloud cover for three or four days, and you couldn't see the horizon, you couldn't see the sun rise or set, you couldn't see stars, you couldn't see the moon. And the only way you could keep the work on track was to see how it was riding across the swells in the direction that you needed it to go. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. What he was showing signs of anxiety, he looked a little bit worried, he kept checking his books, kept checking his calculations, and eventually he came up to me and asked, oh, what should I do? And I said to him, just stop, and just take in everything that's happening around him. And just spend that time to focus on all the signs that were available. And so he did that, he stopped, he just listened to everything with his body, with his mind, with his heart, and really take note of everything that was around him. And during that time, the sky opened up for a fleeting moment. There was a small gap in the clouds and he was able to see the crescent moon in its second quarter. And he knew that the line between the tips of the crescent moon gave us a north-south direction. From that, he knew that we were a little bit off course and that he needed to make adjustments, recalibrate the direction of the waka, which he did. And we set sail on a direct course for Hawaii. And after that experience, he came and sat beside me and said that he now knew that his ancestors would never, ever let him down. And from that moment on, I called him the navigator of our waka the navigator of Honu. And he'd moved into his own space, his rangatira space, a space where he knew he would never be lost. This rangatira space is a place of deep humility. It's leadership with others and not above them. It's a total commitment to your space, your environment, your people, which is what we want for our waka crew. Mo always said that to be a master navigator, you needed to train people to be better than yourself. Success is succession. And Mo said to be a navigator, you must be fierce. A wayfinding leader stands with others from a place of deep humility. They help others step into their own rangatira space. And they have a fierce commitment to their people and to their purpose. And this view of leadership is markedly different from the kinds of leadership we often hear about, especially in the corporate world where some leaders cultivate their positions like a lofty mast, that they alone can see the horizon and see things that others can't see, that they have to be that person around which everyone and everything ought to cohere. However, research shows that this kind of leadership can seriously weaken an organisation and diminish relationships and create dependency. The problem with this form of leadership is that the power of one has the potential to eclipse the power of the collective. And it means that people can't express their own rangatira space. Some people slipstream in behind such leaders, or to think that to get ahead, they have to topple the leader in order to be able to step into their own rangatira space. A word that is closely associated with rangatira is mana. Professor Charles Royal describes mana as an energy, a consciousness in the world. And a leader who leads in a mana-enhancing way really seeks to awaken and release the deeper potential in others. They see the whole person and all that they bring. And that to lead in a mana-enhancing way is to really pay attention to relationships and that comes forward through a process of reciprocity 
and mutual recognition. It points to the collective effort. In our wayfinding leadership workshops, we talk about two forms of mana. Now in the Māori world, there are many forms of mana, but for the purposes of our exercise, we look at assumed mana. Now assumed mana often occurs when we assume a position of authority. It's associated with words like gravitas, charisma, authority. In my own experience, when I've picked up leadership roles, it does feel like some kind of mana got attached to me. It took a while for me to realise, actually it wasn't about me, but it was about the position I held. It's a very inward focused type of thing. Or when I've published an A-tier journal article, and sometimes it feels like the heavens have opened up and some mana glitter falls down and settles on my shoulders and I sparkle for a little while. That's not the kind of mana that we're talking about. In our workshops, we ask people to think about a great leader, someone of mana, and they explore the different qualities that come forward. And these are some of the words that people find in that discussion about these great leaders. It's about humbleness, generosity, strength, and wisdom. It's often very quiet and good listening. And what we see is not so much what people accomplish. In many cases, these great leaders have accomplished great things. Rather, what's really important is how they did it for what purpose and in service of whom? Because it's more than simply accumulating accomplishments. As Hotu said, success is succession. The master navigator, Papa Mo P.I. Log, used to say that success is when you don't have to intervene. So when he took these people on voyages his idea of success on the voyage was when he didn't have to speak, when he didn't have to intervene. Because he knew that if he didn't have to step in, that he had trained a crew that could survive and thrive without him. He understood that it's not about being a know-it-all. True power comes from being an all-know-it. The other part of wayfinding leadership alongside step into your rangatira space is call the island to you. The navigation of um, oceanic navigation involves reading different signs in our environment such as the flight path of homing birds, the star path, the frequencies that ply the ocean, cloud law. And these navigators see themselves and the waka as one. And the idea is to stay as still as possible while the world flies past you and holding the vision of that island and calling it to you. It's been described as like being on a train. You know, sometimes when you're on a train, it feels like you're sitting still and it's the world flying past you out, in the, out the window. It's a similar way of looking at things. So by holding the island clearly in their mind's eye and really staying still and with mastery and discipline adjusting to these different signs, they call the island to them. This is a journey of becoming, not begoing. However, many leaders today really try and use old maps, regurgitated strategies, and outdated plans using KPIs and indicators to plot these really narrow corridors to hit their objective in the most linear, efficient, and direct route possible. Does this seem familiar to you? That we really have this objective, and the idea is we're going to get there as quick as we can. It's very exhausting. The problem with this method is that sometimes we can be completely out of sync with reality, that we are not adjusting dynamically to the environment. In fact, we could be on a fast route to disaster by simply staying in these narrow corridors of rational logic, that where we are heading might not be where we need to be, because as any one of us know, on any given day for all our planning and our logic, life generally shapes up like this. 
some wild card variable will just pop out and we need to be able to respond well. This is a, a capability for a waka or for any organisation that we have people who can respond well to a changing environment. Charles Snyder, a pioneer of positive psychology, said of setting objectives that we don't just need the willpower to achieve our objective, but we also need the way power to find a way. We need this dynamic response ability. So alongside calling the island to us, we need to be able to read the signs and to make interconnections. It's systems thinking of the highest order to create the space to really look around and to tune in to what is important. And we need to be able to move from stillness, something I've really learned about working alongside wayfinders for a number of years now, is this quality of stillness that they have. That when the going gets tough, the tough get relaxed. They come from this place that's really calm and grounded. So they can better and more incisively see what's going on, even in the midst of a great storm, that they can tune in. The Rangatira space is often forged amidst great tests and adversity. And in those times, we really need be able to see that vision of that island and have great courage. And that was my experience. About 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And I was plunged into Te Po, a long, dark night, a place of stillness where I really had to search for the opportunity in adversity and to hold the vision of that island deep within me even when I was in unknown waters. And I saw a new island, the island of recovery. And during this period, people started to appear. My whanau, who were always there for me, elders and mentors who came forward and had a deep belief. They could see that island. They were on my waka with me. And these elders called me to become a rua hine. Rua meaning two, hine, woman. A woman who traverses worlds. Someone who works where the wayfinder works. In the place between what is known and what is yet to be. Someone who is serving a calling. So can you step more fully into your rangatira space and help others step into theirs? And what island are you calling to you? And I'll leave you with one final thought, that the true gift of wayfinding is not arriving at the destination, but it's who we become along the way. Kia ora. Thank you.